Pastor John's new book is about the precious doctrine of God's providence, and uh, the title is simply Providence. God sustains and governs over everything that he made, leading all things to their appointed end. And he reveals this remarkable truth to us in thousands of texts in the Bible. It's all over the place. By welcoming us into this incredible revealed reality, God calls us to see and savor this for ourselves. He wants us to treasure his providence. He wants us to treasure his providence so much that it brings tangible changes to how we live and how we think and how we pray. On Wednesday, as we focus on these implications, we're looking at 10 of them. Last time in episode 1592, we looked at how treasuring God's providence is a spiritual and theological vaccination against man-centered theology. That was implication number seven, episode 1592. Today, we turn to prayer. Here with implication number eight is Pastor John to explain. We're talking about the effects or the benefits or blessings of seeing and savoring the providence of God. Even though, in my experience, they are all wonderful, nevertheless, it feels to me that this one that I'm going to talk about right now is one of the most amazing and precious and wonderful effects of knowing and loving the all-pervading providence of God. It's this. It gives us the confidence that God has the right and the power to answer prayer, especially prayer that asks for people's hearts and minds to be changed. In his New Testament letter, James says, You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. That's James chapter 4, verse 2. That means that things really do not happen that would have happened if we had prayed. In other words, God has ordained that we pray, that we ask, and he has ordained that things happen because we ask, precisely because we ask. Not coincidence, but Cause. You don't have because you don't ask. Prayer is one of the great wonders of the world that God would plan for his own sovereign hand to be moved by the prayers of his creatures is amazing. There are mysteries in it, but these mysteries have never stopped the simplest saint or the most highly educated Christian scholar from weaving the thread of prayer into the whole fabric of their lives. As Paul said, pray without ceasing. There have always been simple folk and highly educated folk who have done this without ceasing kind of weaving and praying in their lives. Maybe you can tell that I am taking one of the common objections to God's providence and turning it upside down into a wonderful blessing of providence. Maybe you noticed that. The objection says, well, there's no point in praying, since according to the doctrine of providence, God has all things planned anyway. But just a little thought would show you that God has planned millions of human acts every day that cause other acts to happen, and without which those other acts would not happen. A carpenter's nail sinks into the board flush because God planned for a hammer to hit it soundly. A student makes an A on a test because God planned for the student to study. A jet flies from New York to Los Angeles because God planned for fuel to be available and wings to stay put and engines to thrust and a pilot to know what he's doing. In none of these cases do we say that the cause was pointless. The hammer the studying, the fuel, the wing, the engine, the pilot, 
neither is prayer pointless. It's one of the God-ordained causes of things that God plans to do. Prayer is part of the plan for how God accomplishes his purposes in the world. In fact, the all-embracing, all-pervasive, unstoppable providence of God is the only hope for making our most heartfelt prayers effective. Let me say that again. It's our only hope. The providence of God is our only hope for making our most heartfelt prayers effective. If God doesn't have the power and the right and the authority to change things, like people's hearts, what's the point in praying about the things that matter most to us? It's precisely his providence that gives us hope that he has the right to do this. What's your greatest longing? What's your most heartfelt desire or prayer? My guess is that for almost all of us, it involves somebody's change. Probably it is the salvation of someone you love, at least that's the case for many of us, or it may be the liberation of your own soul from some sinful bondage. When you pray that God would save your loved one or liberate you, from bondage to sin, what are you asking God to do? You are asking him to do what he promised to do in the new covenant, which Jesus, according to Luke 22.20, bought, secured, guaranteed with his own blood, which is, by the way, why we pray all of our prayers in Jesus' name. We pray, God, Take out of their flesh the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 11, 19. We pray Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Lord, circumcise their hearts. Circumcise my heart so that they will love you, so that I will love you. We pray Ezekiel 36, 27. Father, put your spirit within them and cause them to walk in your statutes. We pray 2 Timothy 2.25, Lord, grant them repentance and the knowledge of the truth so that they may escape from the snare of the devil. We pray Acts 16.14, Father, open their hearts so that they may believe the gospel. The only people who can pray like that consistently are people who believe that saving faith Sanctifying faith, transforming faith, liberating faith is a gift, a work of providence. Many people do not believe this. Millions of Americans have been taught not to believe this because they believe that human beings have the power of ultimate self determination at the point of conversion. God doesn't have it, they have it. In other words, God can woo sinners like a man woos a fiancé. God can woo sinners, but he cannot create their faith, they say. Man must have the final, decisive say. They say, at the point when faith comes into existence, man, not God, is decisive. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe in the providence of God at that very point and its decisive sovereign power. My point here is that people who believe that false teaching cannot consistently pray that God would convert unbelieving sinners. Why? Because if they pray for divine influence, In a sinner's life, they are either praying for an effective influence, a successful influence, which takes away the sinner's ultimate self determination, not their accountability, just their ultimate self determination, or they are praying for a 
less than effective. How should we say it? A, a, a non-successful influence, some kind of nudging. But don't take over, God. Don't be decisive. Don't be sovereign. Just do some wooing, but don't be effective which, of course, is not praying for their conversion. So they must either give up these prayers, these people who pray that way. They must give up praying that God would convert people or give up ultimate human self-determination or go on acting inconsistently, which millions do, praise God. Many people pray way better than they believe. Prayer is a spectacular gift. No one believed more firmly than Paul that humans do not have the final say in their conversion. We don't. God does. It is all of grace, sovereign grace. He said in Romans 9.16, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Nevertheless, Probably no one prayed with more tears and more urgency than Paul for the conversion of sinners. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, he said, for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. That was Romans 9, 2, and 10, 1. He prayed this way because he knew that the new birth is not a mere decision of humans, but a miracle from God. With man, this is impossible, Jesus said. But with God, all things are possible, Matthew nineteen twenty six. So my conclusion is, The all-embracing providence of God does not make prayer a problem. It makes prayer powerful. It makes prayer the wonderful gift that it is. Oh, let us be a praying people. Amen. What a great call. God's providence gives us the confidence that God has the right and the power to answer prayer. That is so, so relevant and so important. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On this podcast, we normally answer questions, and you can send us your own question, or you can search and browse all of our 1,600 past episodes, or you can subscribe to the podcast. You can do all that at desiringgod.org forward slash John. We are going to end the week with one of the most perplexing questions in all of the Bible. If he knew, if he knew that he would betray him in the end, why did Jesus choose Judas as a disciple? to begin with? It's a great question. We get it all the time. We're finally going to address it. I'm your host, Tony Ranke, and we'll see you back here on Friday for that.